I'm joined this afternoon by the founding director of the Kentucky Center for Veteran Studies at Eastern Kentucky University. His new book, War and Homecoming, Veteran Identity and the Post-9-11 Generation, was recently published by the University Press of Kentucky. And this episode of the book series is brought to you in partnership with the University Press of Kentucky. Dr. Martin, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me as your guest. I'm thrilled to be here. Wonderful. I'm very much happy to have you today. I was looking forward to this trend. So before we get to start to talk about the book, I would just want us to talk a bit briefly about the Veterans Center at your university. Um, I understand that you are the founding director of uh, the Veterans uh, Studies Center, and I would want to know how you develop the idea for the center, what the center does, and how it can help different groups of people. Sure. So the Kentucky Center for Veteran Studies is an academic program for both non-veterans, primarily non-veterans and veterans. And we are educating people about the identities, cultures, and experiences that uh, veterans bring to the workplace, to the schools, and to their home communities. And so whenever I started this program, I was my first semester as a master's student here at Eastern Kentucky University. And so if you can think about the process of conceptualizing an academic program, proposing that program to university leaders, and then getting it approved through three different uh, departmental college level and uh, accreditation level committees at such a young age, you would probably realize that's pretty much unheard of. Uh, and that's basically what happened. So I, I came in this, you know, as a as an army sergeant, I got out and I went to college and I looked around and I, I saw all these different studies programs for different identities, whether it be African or African American studies or women and gender studies or Irish studies or Jewish studies. I saw nothing out there for veterans anywhere. And that year, just serendipitously, our um, university had been named uh, the number one in the country for veterans. And so I went up to the Veterans Affairs Director for whom I was the graduate assistant at the time. And I said, we are the best school for veterans, apparently. So why would our school not be the one to start this field? And he said, go for it. And I did. And I had to learn a lot and I made a lot of mistakes, but I found that it was a good idea. And if you're ever trying to make it anywhere in life, you'll find that it's a lot easier if you have a good idea. And that'll just carry you forward because um, we started this process and uh, summer of 2010, and in 2011, we had our first classes being taught. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> our program is going to be primarily for undergraduate students. So our, our introductory course is an, is an introduction, like 200 level course. And we do offer scholarships and awards for students within our program who uh, excel in the areas of service learning, leadership, and scholarship. So there's a very much an activist component to what we're trying to do. So, you know, research is usually within the, uh, the, the domain of the graduates, students and the faculty. But that said, uh, we do uh, are building our, our, our capstone repository of students who go off and create uh, research projects. But another option for them is to create a service project in their home community. Uh, that improves the lives of veterans in some way. And so my focus with this program is really to take students who uh, claim uh, patriotic zeal or who claim a veteran in their family or who are veterans themselves and want to make a difference in veterans' lives, to take those individuals and equip them not only with the knowledge and skills needed to improve veterans' lives, but uh, the, the platform through which to do it. And so uh, the, the Center for Veteran Studies mission then is to form partnerships with individuals who can then empower our students to go off and learn while doing, to make a difference while getting their degree. And so whenever I think about the idea of veteran studies, I think about uh, women and gender studies starting in 1969 or 1970, and then now having uh, programs at, you know, a, let's say a thousand plus schools. I know that's grossly an, uh, a lower end uh, estimation, but every school uh, that has one of those is a potential program to be doing work in the community, and many are. Uh, the vision that I have for veteran studies as an academic field is one that's an activist component with heavy service learning, heavy professionalization, and heavy um, uh, civic engagement components. And so those are the types of things that we're trying to instill uh, within each student who takes even one course in our program. Well, congratulations for setting up that. That's a pretty good job you're doing, and I wish you all the best. 
So now uh, let's get to start to talk about the book. I would want us to get into this discussion. If you can get us the core ideas of this book and its central argument. Yeah, I'll start this by saying like a, a suggestion about how to read the book. And so the way I write, the way I've always written, whether you read like my short scholarly works or anything else, is through a form called autobiographical criticism and social sciences, they may call it autoethnography. But I like to blend in a uh, short story and non and fiction even sometimes with the, the act of research in order to use what Stephen Wine, the autobiographical researcher calls in the book, a shortcut and into the issue itself. And so a lot of times a book can spend half of the half of its length just getting its uh, its readers up to date. And I find that I can do that in 10 pages or so about how a veteran experiences a particular thing just by telling a story from my own life. And so I realized early in my academic career that that was an advantage that I had. Now, that's not to say someone can just go off and tell stories and that be critical theory. What I am attempting to do here is create a work of critical theory that can then be used as a base, a basis for further explorations. And so I intend this book to be simple. I intend it to be easily understood by both uh, uh, advanced researchers and non-academics alike. So that's my suggestion I would make about reading it is just to read it. No, not to come into it with a critical lens uh, the first time. But if you really like the reason this book, and it's only 150 pages or so now that it's published, which surprised me because it was many more whenever it was in a Word document, um, is not to like just sit there and dissect each word, to read it the first time and try to empathize with the veterans that I'm talking about will provide you with a great deal of insight that you, you probably would not have gotten the first time. And so mm -hmm. the second time you go around, then start applying the critical theories from your discipline to the, the phenomenological and sociological issues that I'm describing. And you'll get two very uh, different and sometimes similar experiences. And when they're similar, then you're on to some sort of truth. And I would say, follow that in your own research and your own continuation of the conversation. What, what is veteran impression management? And uh, how do veterans exercise rights to manage their identities? Yes. The concept of the book is that veterans are coming home from military service, uh, specifically American veterans, the way I'm describing this book. Uh, they're coming home from military service uh, and they're being approached with either two forms of identity that they can model as examples of veterans whenever they're trying to figure out who they are, what the big answers to life, what does a veteran do now? They're being met with what I call on one hand, the hero, which is an aggressive form of superficiality, the thank you for your service, the clapping for all veterans, no matter what, the uh, not thinking critically about what veterans do, where they've been and what, what matters to them. That's one side. And the other side is a victimization narrative. And I call that the wounded warrior. The wounded warrior is someone who comes back and just kind of stays quiet because people assume that they're damaged psychologically or physically in some way. And so this is something that's like, uh, you can just, say this happens to every veteran. I'm talking scale, I'm talking uh, meso macro, all of that. Like uh, how, how does a veteran come back and experience the world? And what I'm seeing is that any person, regardless of their age, at least based on our understanding of narratology and the ways people interact with the world, uh, symbiotics, whatever it might be, uh, they, they are looking to others who came before them and they are looking for cultural examples on which to model the basis of their identity. And they are finding within our culture, uh, this superficial form of uh, heroism mm -hmm. and this superficial form of woundedness. Mm -hmm. And uh, both of those are antithetical to our own uh, described uh, needs for them to reassimilate into American society. And so what I want to do is just kind of wake people up to this and especially veterans, so that they can perform more authentic version of themselves, which lies in the act of storytelling. Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets into impression management. And so I am drawing heavily upon the language of Irvin Goffman, but also other autobiographical criticists and uh, theorists in different fields and disciplines who will basically tell you that, you know, all the world's a stage, to quote Shakespeare. And we are all of us, not just veterans, uh, performing the identity that we think uh, people want to see. We are acting as though um, we are the person that we think they, they, they think we think we are. I'm referencing Charles Cooley, the sociologist here. So veterans come back and they are pressured with these two very strong pressures to be a superficial hero and kick up their feet and rest on their laurels, 
or to be a wounded warrior and to sit back and be quiet and let everyone feel pity for you as a way of kind of escalating through society. And neither of these options give the veteran an opportunity to achieve like social upward mobility, for instance, you know, the one thing most people join to get or, you know, just acceptance or appreciation. They're, they're, it's so superficial that veterans themselves can't be individuals. And in America, this pressure upon the veteran is such that it's, uh, it's almost inescapable. It's not quite like racial identity or gender identity in that it's written upon how you look, but it's compelled out of you in such a way that if you are a veteran, you, you, uh, you occupy a symbolic category where you are compelled to identify as one of these two stereotypes, especially if you're of the post 9-11 generation. So now looking at the context of this book, um, and I'm, I'm very happy that you bring the idea of post 9-11 generation. How does post 9-11 therapeutic culture, if I can say, create traumatic assumptions about veterans? Yeah, so the, the the phrase of traumatic assumptions and therapeutic culture, I'm drawing upon a theorist called Ava Luz. And Ava Luz essentially said that in American culture since the 1980s, we've been living in a society which, uh, you know, grants privilege, which grants uh, agency to individuals who can craft a narrative of their life that revolves around trauma. And so if I can say that my strength comes from a trauma, it has had more value to someone saying their strength comes from hard work. And that's a gross uh, simplification of uh, Aluza's theory. But that's the essential uh, underpinning of what I'm talking about when I say uh, wounded warrior, for example. And so the wound becomes a thing that society is afraid to talk about. And when I say wound, I mean both physical and mental. I mean both visible and invisible. And so people assume about veterans that there are things wrong with them simply because they served, even though in this country, uh, the vast majority of veterans who serve in the military do not go to combat, and the vast majority of those do not develop PTSD, and of those, the vast, vast majority are not like on the side of the street in the middle of a psychotic episode. Uh, we, we assume this that about veterans, that if we ask them to talk about their experiences in the military, they're going to have some sort of psychotic break. And we're going to snap into that image from Rambo First Blood, where Sylvester Stallone is in the prison cell having flashbacks. I really look at that as like an iconic moment in veteran history, because it was kind of like a flashpoint in which uh, uh, public perception shifted uh, to the veteran as, you know, unstable or, uh, uh, you know, not a, not a, you know, in addition to society, but rather a, um, a potential threat. Now, I was that, that's not the first time this has been conceived of. And I talk about all the way back to Machiavelli and the book and the, the birth of the citizen soldier and the Italians, all this stuff and the stuff that you, you, you talk about in your research as well, um, about how societies view returning veterans as threats. But I, I like to I like to take in a lot of like the identity theory and, and put that into the conversation with veterans because those conversations tend to be so about uh, policy and, you know, quite frankly, a conservative end of the spectrum uh, arguments. I'm taking identity politics from the far left, stripping out the bare bones of the theories that work, and I'm applying that to veterans. And I'm saying, okay, if we say this about all the other identity populations in the United States, then we claim veterans are a protected class, that they are a form of diversity. What does that say about them? Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to this, uh, this sense of the military veteran as a population, I'm merely trying to caution against the very act of uh, making generalizations, of making assumptions, of making uh, policy based on the, the loud voices of, of a select few. Rather, and this is what I teach in, in, our, in our classes and all our instructors teach in our classes, is that veterans are individuals, that they have intersectional identities. As a group of people, they are non-monolithic. And you have to go up and talk to them as individuals. You cannot map onto them your own preconceived notions of war, morality of war, geopolitics, what you think of military veterans and their political affiliations. Uh, no two veterans are the same. And we have a saying, and I stole this from Dr. David Albright uh, from uh, the University of Alabama's social work program. He's a, a famous scholar. 
Uh, he says, if you know one veteran, you only know one veteran. Mm-hmm. And that is very much the case of veterans, but I would argue too that it's the case of any social group, any social oh, yes. identity. And that I think that veterans, as they have done throughout Americans' historical uh, a narrative, they have identified a problem with the ways in which we deal with, you know, existing issues that have nothing to do with them. Mm-hmm. And so, if you you want to ask about, for instance, uh, diversity and equity and inclusion, well, these programs were addressed early you know on this debate about veteran studies in 2010 and 2011 Mm -hmm. where there was a large movement within academia to respond to the needs of veterans in the classroom Mm -hmm. and the responses were purely deficit based they were like veterans have ptsd veterans have gone through this they've gone through that we're not equipped to deal with them oh my ring of hands you know, all of this, we're not going to survive this influx of veterans into academia. I bet in your research into World War II, if you looked at the American side of it anyway, you would see cries from college presidents about what to do about these uh, American jungle hobos of veterans who are going to return to college campuses with their GI Bill. Uh, America's response to veterans in higher education is a side of major transportation uh, uh, transformation is a longstanding tradition. And so What I'm saying is that veterans are teaching us something now about how to respond to the needs of other diverse groups. Mm -hmm. If we go and we try to paint all veterans with a broad brush and say, all right, they've all they've all been through combat. They've all been through this. They've all got PTSD. Let's just treat them all like that. It will ultimately push many of those veterans down a path of uh, not self-actualization, but rather, uh, you know, I, I guess a a less uh, substantial accomplishment of their of their goals the best version of themselves i like to say so Mm -hmm. that's that's my caution with i would say what we're learning from the study of veteran identity and how it can be applied to other forms of identity Mm -hmm. that is wonderful thank you thank you so much uh, for giving this interview viewers and listeners this was dr travis martin uh he is the founding director of the kentucky center for veteran studies at eastern kentucky university his new book, War and Warm Coming, Veteran Identity and the Post-9-11 Generation, was recently published by the University Press of Kentucky, and it can be accessed on the link that I'm going to paste right in the description panel on the upload for this video. This episode of the book series was brought to you in partnership with the University Press of Kentucky. Dr. Travis, thank you so much for the time. Thanks for having me, sir. It's been a wow. pleasure. Wonderful.